All right, guys, we're just waiting for people to come back. I apologize for that profusely, what just happened. Apparently, here on Saturdays, the cleaning people come in and one of them hit the fire alarm. And it just so happens I'm on the 17th floor, which means I had to go all the way down and then wait outside for everything to be okay and then run all the way back up. 17 floors up and down is probably more exercise than I do in a week. But for you guys, rock and roll, right? Had to catch my breath for a little while. Look, I had Starbucks this morning. But did you guys hear the fire alarm in the background while I was speaking? You probably did. I guess you guys probably heard the fire alarm in the background. Was that super weird when I was talking and you heard the fire alarm like, everybody exit the building. Do not take the elevator. You guys ever had a fire alarm where you're just like, I'm almost positive this is not a real fire. But in the back of your head, you're like, you know, if it is real, I probably shouldn't be here. Even though you know you're going to go down, it's going to be totally annoying. And it's going to come back up. It's going to be nothing. But still, you're just like, eh, just in case. That's what happened. The whole time I kept talking, I was like, this isn't real. This isn't real. But just in case. So there it was. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Terry. I appreciate it. I'm fine. Just a little winded from the unnecessary exercise. Other than that, I'm good. All right, there's a lot of exercise there. All right, it looks like we got most of the people back. All right, it looks like we got a good portion of everybody who's here back now. All right, so that's a good thing. Okay, I just gave it a few more minutes to start the lesson. But in the meantime, I wanted to finish what I was saying before. What I was saying when the fire alarm started was that we did a focus a group, okay? And people came back to us and said that they enjoyed getting a daily email, all right? A daily email, all right? A daily email giving facts and questions that relate to your studies or real estate exam. Arthur and I were originally worried that it was, could be a little spammy and a little annoying to get an email from us every day. But it turned out the feedback we got was it would actually be helpful because it keeps everybody abreast of their studies and it keeps them on track in addition to learning a different fact every day, but more importantly, it keeps everybody on task. So Arthur created that, and now it's part of our premium package for members. Arthur is online. You can see him there. Arthur, clarify that for me in case I'm stating that wrong. Um, but now he's including that. And just so you guys know, I do a lot of the content. I do a lot of talking, as you know. Arthur builds all this great stuff that you guys use for the technical side, from the emails to the system all that kind of stuff. And that's how Arthur and I kind of work here. So give him all the credit he deserves for any things you like, like the way it's laid out for the questions and, and how it's set up. And you can give me credit for speaking. All right. And we tend to be a pretty good team. Okay. So any questions about those emails or about the website, you can ask now. Arthur's on the chat. So Jorge asked, how did I get added to it? It's part of our membership. So there we go. In the meantime, I'm going to go on these questions. So now, um, as per the questions, if your screen is blurry, make sure you change to 720 HD. 720 HD. Okay, here we go. All right, we answered this one. The most detailed appraisal report is the narrative appraisal report. Let's go on to the next question. A lease requiring the tenant to pay, in addition to a fixed rental, the expense of the property leases such as taxes, insurance, and maintenance. A, net lease. B, gross lease. C, percentage lease. Or D, sandwich lease. OK, 
Okay, the answer is net lease, also known as a triple net lease. Okay, it's also known as a triple net lease. Good job, everybody. It stands for paying for tax insurance and maintenance. Do you see this type of lease on your standard residential rental? Do you see this type of lease on your standard residential rental? What do you guys think? Do you see this type of lease in your standard residential rental? So you see three other leases on the board. What type of lease is on your standard residential rental? What type of lease is on your standard residential rental? That would be the gross lease, okay, a gross lease. A gross lease is the lease where you pay a set amount and it's yours. There it is. A percentage lease is what? Who could define a percentage lease using as few words as possible? And that's important here, guys. When you learn this vocabulary, you want to use as few words as possible. Remember, there's a lot to memorize. So the more you can minimize it, the better. So a percentage lease using a few words as possible. What do you guys think? Percent of gross receipts. Nice job, Tom Wolf. Love that. That's a great way to say it. Percent of receipts. Excellent, Tom. Good job. Okay, the last one you see is sandwich lease. You guys ever heard of a sandwich lease? There's another word for it that may be pretty common to you guys. What's a sandwich lease? Anybody ever heard of this before? Sublease. Nice job, Deanna. Well done. That's a sublease. Good. Another way to say this for a sandwich lease. Everybody ready for this? Here we go. Another word for a sandwich lease is when the lessor is also the lessee. When the lessor is also the lessee. The lessor is also the lessee. Do you guys know what I mean by that? When the lessor is also the lessee. The lessor is also the lessee. What do you guys think? Do we all know our O-R-E-E -E rule? What's the O-R? O-R is the give or, so that'd be like the landlord. E-E -E receives. So they receive that lease. And when you're a subletting, you're in the middle. You're receiving it from the landlord, but then you're turning around, okay, and you're giving it to a new tenant. All right. Another way to say a sublet is when you transfer, when you transfer the right to occupy, but you don't transfer responsibility. Because the original person is still responsible. Okay. We've got to know our O-R-E-E -E rule, guys. Remember, lessor, get, uh, vendor, uh, grantor is the give or the propertor for your pleasure. Lessee, vendee, grantee, give me property, makes me happy. I know it sounds ridiculous, but when you pass your exam, you'll have no problem that you memorize that ridiculous rhyme. Lessor, vendor, give or the propertor for your pleasure. Lessee, vendee, grantee, gives me property, makes me happy. All right? Anybody else feel ridiculous saying that? If you do, don't worry about it. Only feel ridiculous if you're not studying for your exam. If you're studying for your exam, it makes sense. Okay, next question. A listing under which a real estate agent receives any amount over a given net amount to the seller, A, an exclusive listing, B, a non-exclusive listing, C, a net listing, a D and open listing. All right. The answer is C. Now, net listings are illegal in many states, if not most states. Now, why is that? Because even in the states where they're legal, they're seen as extremely unethical. They're not like a good idea. Most states have them as illegal. Why is that? Why do most states say, you know what, this net listing thing, not happening here? Okay, we're not allowing net listings. Okay, so why is that? 
So Ashley says because it's a conflict of interest. That's excellent, Ashley Neal. Spot on. Good. It's illegal in most states, and if not illegal, definitely just a horrible idea, unethical, because if you get an offer for 500 grand and the owner wants to sell for 500 grand, you get nothing. So Liat, that's why it's a conflict because the seller just wants 500 grand. So they're excited for their $500,000. A buyer comes in with a $500,000 and there lies the conflict because doing the best job for the seller means you give them that offer. But then that entails you get absolutely nothing. So it's in your interest to make that offer disappear, like accidentally lose it, in hopes a higher offer comes in, even though it's not in the best interest of the seller. Because that makes where there's potential for it not being fair either to the seller or to you. And so most states say, well, just not going to allow this. We'd rather have listings that require to be mutually beneficial to the person selling the house and the person putting in all the effort finding the buyer. Does that make sense? Okay, so you see on the board an exclusive listing and an open listing. Okay, so a non-exclusive listing is just another word for an open listing, in case you guys didn't know. A non-exclusive listing is just another word for an open listing. So we got exclusive listing and open listing. Which one of those does not need a definite termination date? Which one of those does not need a definite termination date? What do you guys think? So exclusive listing or open listing, which one does not need a definite termination date? All of you guys are saying open, so my next question would be why? So my double or nothing question would be why? Why does an open listing not need a termination date, but an exclusive listing does need a definite termination date? Why do you guys think? What's the reasoning behind that? Why does an exclusive listing need a termination date, but an open listing does not need a definite termination date? So it has nothing to do with the seller being able to sell it. Okay, so here's the answer for you guys. In an exclusive listing, you guys can only have one broker. In an open listing, you could have as many as you want. That part I think you know. So the next logical step is to realize that exclusive listing, if there's only one broker and they do a bad job, what do you do, right? If they're not finding the buyer, they're not doing their thing, well, they can't be there forever, okay? They have their fair chance. You say they're not doing a good job. The broker says, I'm doing a good job. You just have to understand the process. I need to do my thing. So in order to be fair for both parties, there's a termination date. So the broker could write 90 days. And he says, you got to give me the 90 days. You can't judge me after a week. You got to let my marketing come through, let all my efforts take its course, and then we'll evaluate after that. So you got to give the 90 days. So the seller could say, all right, but after 90 days, if you don't do what you said you're going to do, I want to find somebody else. And that's fair. So there's a definite termination date. You can't bind yourself to one broker for perpetuity, forever. As opposed to an open listing, you can hire as many brokers as you want. So the open listing, the moment you feel the broker who's trying to help you is not doing a good job, you could call another one within the hour. It does not matter. No termination day is needed. You could seek other help at any time you want, you being the seller. Does that make sense, guys? That's why an exclusive listing needs that termination date, okay? Because there's only one broker there, right? You need a time where you could end your relationship with him or her and find somebody else. Does that make sense? So I noticed a lot of you guys got the word open listing correct, but you didn't get the reasoning why correct. So I really wanted to clarify that for everybody so we could all get that right for the exam. So hopefully you guys don't mind me going on that little tangent there. All right, next question. Belonging or relating to the bank of a river or stream? A, avulsion, B, deciduous, C, riparian, or D, littoral? What do you guys think?
All right, and the answer is riparian. Riparian rights have to do with what? So you have riparian and littoral. Nice job, Audrey Gordon Moore. I love that you wrote moving body water and you did not write river. Okay. Now I understand a lot of you guys learned river. I understand why. Riparian river, littoral lake. The reason I love that Audrey wrote moving body water, because what are you going to do if river is not one of the answers? What if it's stream? What if it's a creek or any moving water course? Okay, so when you remember riparian river, that's a memory technique. It's not always the answer. By definition, riparian rights don't have to do with rivers. Rivers are obviously part of it, can be riparian rights, but it's not the true definition. Just like littoral lake, littoral has to do with body water standing still. I tell everybody many times, be careful when you memorize memory techniques. You can't just memorize the memory technique. You got to memorize why it's there. For example, if I say real property, what are you guys going to tell me? If I say real property, what are you going to tell me? If I say personal property, what are you going to tell me? What would you guys say? Real property and personal property. What would you say? Okay, so you'd probably say real property, immovable. Personal property, movable. Real property, immovable, personal property, movable. Right, guys? But is that always the case? Is real property always immovable? And is personal property always movable? Nice job, London. London Vane. I hope I said your name right. She wrote, personal property goes with a person. Excellent. Real property goes with the real estate and personal property goes with a person. So remember that immovable movable thing is a memory technique. It's not an absolute rule. The true definition is real property goes with the real estate, personal property goes with a person. Can you guys give me an example of some personal property that is immovable? Who could give me an example of personal property that is not movable. So something that contradicts that, that, that simple definition of personal property movable, general real property immovable. So what do you guys think? So not a fixture, a fixture is real property. A fixture is real property. Fixtures are not personal property. Amy Williams says trade fixture. Great job, Amy Williams. So certain trade fixtures are personal properties immovable like a dentist chair. A dentist chair is immovable, but it's actually personal property because when the, the lease ends or the sells or whatever it may be, they take the property with them. Okay, now I see a lot of you guys giving examples of real property that is actually movable. So what's that? So give me some examples of real property that's movable. Okay, the big one that I like to give. All right, is the pool covering. A pool covering is real property, even though it's movable. You take it off, you put it back on the pool all the time. Why? Because it goes with the real estate. Real property goes with the real estate. What word do you learn in your studies that means runs with the land, goes with the real estate? Anybody know? I'll give you a hint. It starts with an A. It starts with an A. So this has to do with rights or interest, things of that nature. So what word did you lose? You start with an A. A pertinence. Excellent. A pertinent. Okay, nice job, Liat, Alana, Tom. First one's on the board. Give you a big high five there. A pertinent. When something is a pertinent, it means it runs with the land. You could have easements, you have different rights that are a pertinent. Okay. All right. Good job, everybody. A law which limits the bringing of court action, civil or criminal, to within a specified period of time. A, statute of limitations. B, statute of time. C, statute of years. Or D, statute of frauds. All right, and the answer is... 
A, statute of limitations. Statute of limitations do with time. Statute of frauds have to do with writing. And the other two are just things made up to throw you off. Remember, if you've never heard of it, you'll never circle it. Okay? Everybody promise me. Right? In fact, let's all write that down. If I haven't heard of it, I won't circle it. If I haven't heard of it, I won't circle it. Okay? Stuti, there's no such thing as statute of latches. Latches is something that causes unfair delay in a contract. I could look that up for you, but I believe it's the answer. Amy Williams, the way you make your screen more clear is clicking on the gearbox on the bottom right of the rectangle and putting on 720 HD. You'll see a little thing that says HD. Okay, next, if I haven't heard of it, I won't circle it. There will be times you take your exam and you're gonna look at it and be like, wow, that looks right, that looks like something important. I don't remember study, but maybe just because I haven't studied enough, maybe that's why I don't recognize it. Any of you guys ever felt that way when you've done some tests? You're like, well, I haven't really studied enough, so maybe it's there, I just don't recognize it because I haven't worked as hard as I should have. Okay, don't fall for that. All right, if you haven't heard of it, don't circle it. You have to trust in your studies. You have to trust that you're, what you're studying is what you need to know for the exam, okay? So if you haven't recognized it, that means it wasn't in your studies, which means it's not the answer because it's not something you needed to know. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, next question. A general term used to include any property which gives the owner certain income tax advantages, such as deductions for property taxes, maintenance, mortgage interest, insurance, and especially depreciation. A, tax shield. B, tax shelter. C, tax roof. Or D, tax lien. And the answer is B, tax shelter. What is a tax lien? First of all, is a tax lien a specific lien or a general lien? Is a tax lien a specific lien or a general lien? What do you guys think? Is a tax lien a specific lien or a general lien? All right, so that was actually a trick question for you guys. The answer is, it depends. Nice job, Ann Morris, great job. I wish I could give you a high five. Nice job, Ann. It depends, okay? Property tax is a specific lien. Income tax is a general lien. Everybody got that? That's right, Quiet Girl. Quiet Girl 808. Some of you guys got some super awesome names for uh, chat handles. Okay, so a property tax is a specific lien. Income tax is a general lien. What is the difference between a property, excuse me, a general lien and a specific lien? What is the difference between a general lien and a specific lien? Angela, we will. We'll post it later so you can watch it. No, don't worry about it. And if you don't get it, just send me an email and I'll send you a link. Angela Williams, Proverbs 31. I'll make sure you get the recording. Okay, so a general lien means they're going to come after everything. A specific lien, all right, means they can only one thing, come after one thing, such as the property. Okay, what I'd like to do is switch over to the flashcards. Okay, because that's the other way that we like to learn our vocabulary. So remember, we said there's vocabulary questions and then there's the flash arts, all right? So when I put this on the board, I want you to answer this using as few words as possible, using as few words as possible. Okay, first one on the board, zoning. What do you guys think? What do you guys think?
Okay, so you got a police power. Police power. Good. Zoning is a police power. What other police powers are there? Okay, zoning regulates the control, the use of the land. Okay, so you got the zoning. Okay, so building codes are also a police power. What are the other three government powers? What are the other three government powers? What do you guys think? What are the other three government powers? So you got eminent domain, taxation, is cheat. Okay, so you got police power, eminent domain, taxation, and is cheat. All right, estate at sufferance. Estate at sufferance. Right, deadbeat tenement, tenant, excuse me, deadbeat tenant. Estate at sufferance is a type of less than freehold estate. Can you guys name the other three types of less than freehold estates? What are the other three types of less than freehold estates? So bingo, Lizotte, You, if you are a member on our website, you could view it via our control panel. Okay, so the other types of less than free old estates are estate at sufferance, which we on the board, estate at will, periodic tenancy, and estate for years. Good, those are the types of less than free old estates. A deed. What's a deed? What's a deed? Okay, deed is evidence of the transfer. Evidence of transfer. What's title? What do you guys think? Okay, what's title? So title is ownership. Deeds, the evidence of the transfer. All right, guys? So title is ownership. We'll talk more about that in a second. But it's really important you know the difference. Deed is evidence transfer, title is ownership. Just out of curiosity, how many of you guys are watching this on a mobile device and how many of you guys are not? How many of you guys are watching this on a mobile device? And how many of you guys are watching on a more standard device, like a computer or laptop? Oh, so we got a bunch of people watch this on mobile. Man, I didn't realize that. Is this working well on mobile? If it isn't, we can modify it a little for you guys. We want to make this as easy to see as possible for everybody. All right, condemnation. Well, it's a great question, Hannah. Anna asks, what transfers personal property? Anybody know the answer to that? What transfers personal property? That was a great question, Hannah. What transfers personal property? A bill of sale. I love that question. Thanks for jumping in there. Bill of sale. Okay, in condemnation, the one on the board, that's taking property for public use under the rights of eminent domain, and just compensation must be paid. Economic obsolescence. What do you guys think? Economic obsolescence. Okay, 
economic obsolescence. That is a form of depreciation that is outside the property lines, outside the property lines. Can you guys give me an example of economic obsolescence? Can you guys give me an example of economic obsolescence? Good, quiet girl, 808, like an airport, good one. Gas stations, murder in the neighborhood, good. Ooh, it's a little dark and grim, but yes, murder in the neighborhood. All right, there's two other forms of depreciation that come up on your exam. Do you guys know what they are? So you have economic obsolescence. What are the other two? What are the other two forms of depreciation that could come up on your exam? What do you guys think? Congrats on surviving cancer, Amy. That's awesome. Congratulations. It's great news. Okay, functional and physical. Okay, which one is not a form of obsolescence? You got economic, functional, and physical. Which one's not a form of obsolescence? Which one is not a form of obsolescence? And the answer is physical deterioration. Good. By the way, these flashcards are doing right now really work well on your mobile devices. Arthur did a great job of building it, so it shows up really well on your mobile devices, and you just touch it with your thumb, and it switches over the cards. So he really did an awesome job with that. So when you guys are online at the post office or watch your kid's game, then you could look at these flashcards. Well, you should be watching your kid's game if you're at the kid's game. But I won't tell them. Okay, straight note. So a straight note is when you are only paying for the interest. Paying, only paying the interest. Only paying the interest. Let's see. Statue of frauds. We went over that before. We did a question on that. So we should get this one right. Statue of frauds have to do with writing. Good, as opposed to statute of limitations has to do with time. Okay, executory contract. What is an executory contract? Anybody know? It's right, it's in process, not yet completed. Who could tell me the four essentials of a valid contract? What are the four essentials of a valid contract? Anybody know? The four essentials of a valid contract are offer and acceptance, capable parties, consideration, and lawful object. So you got mutual consent, capable parties, consideration, lawful object. When you have agreement, which is also known as offer and acceptance, capable parties, it's a three step process. What is those three steps? What are the three steps for mutual consent to be considered mutual consent? 
What do you guys think? What are those three steps? Anybody know? So the three steps for mutual consent, what are they? Meeting of the minds is the same thing as offer and acceptance. So what it is, is offer, accept, and communicate back to the acceptance to the offeror. Offer or makes the offer, offer E receives the offer, and offer E communicates acceptance back to the offer or. All right, guys, just imagine I make an offer to you on your house, you accept it, but what does that mean to me? I don't know you accept it, so what will I do? I'll make an offer on another house, obviously, because I don't know you accepted it. So you need offer acceptance, and you got to let me know that you accepted it. Makes sense, right, guys? Because otherwise, I'll go about my life and I'll go put an offer on another house. It's one of those obvious ones people miss a lot. So I wanted to make sure we nail that down. Am I right? Once you guys heard it, you're like, oh, that makes sense. So hopefully, we'll all get that right on our exam. Okay, negative amortization. What's negative amortization? Good job, Hannah. What's negative amortization? Okay, Tom Wolf says debt increases. Tom, why does that debt increase? What's happening there? Okay, negative amortization is when your payments do not cover the interest. Your payments do not cover the interest. Interest only would be that straight note, also known as interest only. Your payments do not cover the interest, your debt goes up. Abstract of title. What do you guys think? Abstract of title. Anybody? Abstract is a summary, is a summary. People very often get this confused with a chain of title. Chain of title is only the list of owners, the people who've owned it, the, the, the lineage of the ownership of the property. Abstract contains that and a lot more. And you guys ever get that confused, the abstract with the chain of title? Okay, panic peddling, what's that? It's also the same as panic selling and blockbusting, if that helps. So panic peddling, panic selling, blockbusting, take your pick. What is that? What do you guys think? Panic selling, panel peddling, or blockbusting? What is that all about? It is illegal. Okay, it is a form of discrimination because you're telling you better sell because those people are moving into town. Those people are moving into town. All right, what is this a violation of? What is this a violation of? What does this violate? What do you guys think? It violates fair housing. And what year was that fair housing enacted? This is my last question of the day. What year did fair housing come? What year is fair housing? 1968. Remember, on our exam, we're always going to circle 1968. I don't care if it asks how old you are. I don't care if it asks what year it is. I don't care if it asks what year the Yankees win the pennant. 1968 is the answer. That may really be the answer for the Yankees, actually. I'm not sure. 
Hey, but you're always going to circle 1968. Everybody promise. If I ask you what year were you born, what are you guys going to say? What year is everybody born? 1968. What year were your kids born? 1968. What year did you graduate high school? 1968. All right, everybody get the idea? So if you guys see 1968 on your exam and you don't circle, I have failed you as a human being. All right, guys. Well, that's it for today. We will be back on Tuesday with the webinar for our premium members. And I will talk to you guys soon. Everybody join our exam study group and have a wonderful weekend. Have an amazing weekend. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I did a good job. And obviously, I apologize for the, um, the fire alarm in the beginning. That was awkward. Hey, thanks, guys.